this morning is from the Gospel of John. It's John chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. It's found on page 877 in your pew Bibles. It's titled, Jesus Prays to be Glorified. John 17, 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Today's readings take place between Easter and Pentecost. That sounds like the lead into a movie, though, doesn't it? Or Kiefer Sutherland in the TV show 24. Today's episode takes place between Easter and Pentecost in the year of our Lord, 4 AD. Actually, it unfolds just before Easter and just before Pentecost, but consider all that takes place. Our gospel lesson is another peek at the night of the Last Supper. Jesus and his disciples have left the upper room and are now somewhere between there and the Garden of Gethsemane, probably out on the streets of Jerusalem or maybe down in the Kidron Valley. But they're between Jesus washing their feet and telling them goodbye and getting arrested in the middle of the night. Our reading from Acts happens several weeks later, after the empty tomb, after the road to Emmaus, after that doubting thing with Thomas in the upper room behind locked doors, after the resurrection. Keep that in mind. Forty days after, to be exact, according to verse 3. It's ten days prior to Pentecost, and Jesus is talking with his disciples, having their last earthly conversation. He's making them a promise, and in addition, giving them a mandate and a mission. And then, as they watch, he's taken up into the sky, right before their eyes, and hidden by a cloud. A lot happened between Easter and Pentecost, didn't it? It often does. And our lectionary texts set like bookends on a number of monumental biblical events. The betrayal, the arrest, the trial. Jesus standing before the high priest and then before Pilate. The flogging, the crown of thorns. The crucifixion, the resurrection, the empty tomb. Jesus (coughs) talking with the women outside of that empty tomb and meeting with his disciples in that locked upper room on two different occasions. There was the road to Emmaus, remember, and breakfast on the beach. And now they're sharing another meal out on the Mount of Olives when Jesus suddenly ascends into heaven. That's the setting. That's the context, if you will, of the greatest drama of all time. So try to imagine what the disciples must have been feeling. John writes that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus, quote, looked up toward heaven and prayed. Scholars call this the high priestly prayer, and with good reason, I'd say. Read it sometime. It's powerful. First, Jesus prays for himself, which is always a good thing, right? Then he prays for his disciples, which also makes sense. Then he prays for us, for all believers everywhere, 
in every time and place. I find that extremely humbling. Don't you? The Son of God offers up an intercessory prayer to his heavenly Father on our behalf. He prays for our protection, prays for harmony, that we will all be one. He then prays for our mission, that we'll carry out his mission to make God known in the world. I'm not sure we can grasp the magnitude of that. Jesus beseeches the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, to equip us for the task of spreading the gospel. He asks his Father to pour out power and wisdom on us through the Holy Spirit. That's more than humbling, actually. Our Lord lifts up his eyes towards heaven and prays for the church. Now hold that thought for a moment and jump ahead to our reading from Acts. And let me remind you that the book of Acts is the written record of the early church. And it's here that we witness Jesus' high priestly prayer starting to unfold. Unfolding around us and through us and with us. We see believers united together and in obedience stepping out to make God known in the world. We witness the promised Holy Spirit filling the church with power. We see harmony and joy and protection in some Pretty intense times. And at the very beginning of this written record, at the very start of church history, we see Jesus ascending into glory, returning to the Father, just as he promised he would. It's an amazing series of events. It's all part of a plan, a plan put into place since the very beginning. Prophecies are fulfilled right before the eyes of the disciples. (coughs) And their reaction to that For those who follow Jesus is that they, quote, peer intently up into the sky. It says they watched intently as the Lord ascended into the clouds. And I, for one, wonder what that was like. Don't you? Would have certainly been an off-filled moment, to say the very least. Not sure words can really describe it, but I'm curious. What do you think the disciples were thinking? Or better yet, what were they feeling? I even wonder what they were doing, don't you? I mean, how did they watch the Lord disappear? Do you think it was actively or passively? Were their hearts filled with joy as they gazed up into the sky or filled with doubts? Were they overwhelmed with grief maybe as they watched Jesus disappear? Or was it something else? Do you think they trusted in the promise, you know, Believe the prophecies? Do you think they were looking forward to their mission and to the Holy Spirit empowering them to fulfill it? Are they worried about the future or concerned about themselves? What would you be feeling if you were there? What are their facial expressions? And what does that imply? What was their body language like? And what did that say? I mean... These are the forefathers of the faith, right? Their reactions might give us some insight into what our attitude should be. How are we to wait when we feel alone or as we watch Jesus return in the same way that he left? It's weird, right? Living between Easter and Pentecost. It's weird living between the Lord's resurrection and his ascension into heaven and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It's weird living between Easter and the Lord's return at the end of the age. You might prefer the word surreal or scary even or exciting. But you know how we wait? As we wait? Makes all the difference in the world. You remember a couple weeks ago talking about looking up, keeping our eyes on Jesus no matter what comes our way? Well, that's what I want the disciples to be doing. I want them standing there with their hands raised in praise to the Lord as he ascends through the clouds, giving glory to God as the heavenly host welcomes Jesus back home. I want joy and jubilation on their, facement, on their faces and excitement in their hearts. I want the church, the early one, as well as the one we have today, to claim the promise, to boldly 
and exuberantly claim the promise. I want to see faith unbelievably strong. But what if that wasn't the case? I mean, listen to the words of those two men standing next to them, dressed in white, who I presume are angels. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? It's an admonition, isn't it? Why are you just standing here? I wonder if they were gawking. You know, standing there with their jaws dropped and their mouths open with their hands in their pockets and the feet shuffling around, wondering what in the world to do next. I wonder if they were in shock or filled with terror even. Were they stuck because of fear or paralyzed by the unknown? Were they arguing with each other, do you think, over what all this might mean? Do you think they were wondering what was going to happen now or when things were going to happen? I mean, we know that they were at least curious about when Jesus would restore God's kingdom. They ask him point blank in verse 6. So I wonder if the angel's message was more like, Okay, people, show's over. Now it's time to get to work doing what Jesus told you to do. Why are you just standing here looking up into the sky? What was their stance, their attitude, their hopes, their dreams, their expectations? What should ours be? What's the typical stance of a follower of Jesus when the Lord disappears from sight. They were looking intently up into the sky. I remember a psychology class in college, my first one in fact, the professor gave us a lab assignment and divided us into groups. He told us to create an experiment, one with measurable results that was based on human behavior. We could employ any props that we wanted to, or none at all. Our experiment could involve conscious or unconscious or subconscious thought. It was pretty open-ended, really, with one caveat. Had to be a blind study. Participants had to be unaware of the experiment. Other than that, though, we had pretty much free reign on our design. We had the entire weekend to pull it off as well, so being young, enterprising college students back in the 70s, When there were such things, we headed off to the mall. Our plan was pretty simple. Two of us would stand in the middle of the mall and stare up at the ceiling, while third member stood off to the side and took notes. We didn't do anything. We didn't point. We didn't make any noise, at least not in the first round. We just stood there and looked up. Come to think of it, we looked up intently, maybe, We didn't make any facial expressions, though, or imply that we were emotionally moved by what we saw. We just stood there in the middle of the mall looking up. Have you ever done that? It's actually kind of fun. Not to mention enlightening. When you look up, people around you tend to look up. It's true. Apparently, they don't want to miss out on anything. Curiosity gets the best of them, and the more intently you are in the looking, the more folks will look up themselves, and the longer they'll continue to look. There's just something innate in the human psyche that beckons us to look up when someone else is, at least at first. We also found, though, that if no one on our team looked up, no one else did either. It's not really surprising, though. And if while you were looking up, you just stand there all gloomy and sad or bored even, or those who do look up will only do it briefly. Rather quickly, they'll just move on, simply return to everyday life. You see where I'm going with this, right? The whole thing makes me wonder, how does the way in which we look up to heaven affect our mission to make God known in the world. We know that what we do and how we do it either invites people into the body of Christ or it repels them, right? So what are today's texts 
saying to you and me? As followers of Jesus, how are we supposed to respond to dark times when God appears to disappear from sight? And more importantly, maybe, how does our response speak to those around us? I think we need to ask ourselves if what we do (coughs) tells people that God is still active and working in our world, or if it appears that we think he's gone. Are we waiting expectantly and excitedly for his return, pointing to heaven so that others will look up too? Or do we just appear bored or tired or sad, grumpy maybe, or worried that God's disappeared for good? Does it look to those around us as if we're staring up into a blank sky? Or are we demonstrating a heartfelt faith even when the sky fills up with clouds? I don't want to overextend the metaphor or anything, but how do we experience the ascension of Jesus and, of course, his return? How do we experience the blessings of the Holy Spirit right here and now? Are we doing it actively and with enthusiasm, or is it passively or even timidly? What I'm trying to say is if a couple of angels were to suddenly appear beside you dressed radiantly in white and ask you, why are you standing here looking up into the sky, how would you answer them? Jesus prayed, Father, the time has come. I will remain in the world no longer. I've brought you glory on earth. I've revealed you to the world. Eternal life is in knowing you, the only true God, and in knowing in Christ whom you've sent. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. So protect them. Sanctify them by the truth of your word. Bring them to complete unity so that the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love me. What a final, prayerful goodbye. What a eulogy. What a legacy. I think a prayer like that in the middle of the night would have gotten my attention. Don't you? And then just a few weeks later, again, after Jesus' arrest and trial, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, after the empty tomb, the believers are together again listening to the teaching of the Lord. And once again, he's talking about the Holy Spirit coming upon them in power and might. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will. In all honesty, it's hard to imagine how it must have felt or even to contemplate what all of this means, let alone watch as Jesus starts to rise towards heaven. I guess I might have stood there gaping myself at the sky until he was completely hidden by a cloud, but then after a while, what would I do? That's really the question, isn't it? What would you do after you caught your breath? After your moment of doubt or self-pity? How should you respond now, even in the midst of God appearing to disappear from sight? Well, I guess you could be like Linus in the Charlie Brown comic strip. I don't like to face problems head on, he says. I think the way to solve any problem is to avoid it completely. In fact, that's a distinct philosophy of mine. No problem is so big or so complicated that you can't be run away from. Or you could be like Kevin from Home Alone. When God disappears, you could run into your room and throw a tantrum, but then slowly begin to see that absence as freedom. God's authority is completely set aside, You might even have fun for a while. You have the run of the entire house. You can do whatever you want. Watch movies, eat junk food, stay up late, skip school, skip church. Eventually, though, you're going to discover that you're living in isolation and fear. Eventually, you'll notice that you're home alone. What then? 
Carolyn Watterson has a plaque in her office. It's a part of a quote from Mother Teresa. She said, The spiritual poverty of the Western world is so much greater than the physical poverty of our people in India. You in the West have millions of people who suffer such terrible loneliness and emptiness. The largest disease in the world today is not leprosy or cancer. It's the feeling of being uncared for, unwanted, of being deserted and alone. Do you think that might be why Jesus prayed, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they will all be one? Or I guess you could be like Winnie the Pooh's friend Eeyore. Just well up with doom and gloom, mope around, be sad, be depressed. Or you could respond in anger, take out your disappointment on those around you. You could stand in the midst of all the other disciples and constantly talk about how you've been let down. Don't forget, though, The choice is yours. No one, not one thing, causes you to be a certain way. How you respond to anything is totally up to you. Let's be honest. There's a lot happening in our world these days. And it would be very easy to feel as if the Lord has disappeared from sight. He hasn't, though. Let me assure you, we even have a promise. I get it. It might be easy to be down or to feel that way with all that's unfolding around us, at least momentarily, but then, after a moment, how should we respond? Should we put our heads down, our hands in our pockets and sort of shuffle about? Or should we raise our hands Lift them up in praise. That's really the question, isn't it? The ultimate question. That's always the question. How should we respond? Before you answer, though, let me remind you you that Luke addresses the book of Acts as well as his gospel to someone named Theophilus. It's a Greek name, which means God lover or friend of God. So, Let me rephrase the question. What should a lover of God do when the heavens are quiet and the sky appears empty? What is a friend of God supposed to do in times of absence? What are you doing right now? And all of God's people said, I invite you to listen for the Holy Spirit nudging your hearts as we stand and sing. Will you please stand?